Alrighty, welcome everybody. So I'm just gonna use the mic, uh, we're recording this, so the, we don't have speakers in here, it's just for the recording, so it may look weird, so I just wanted to say that. So I'm Eric Blue, I'm your host for tonight. Um, so we're in for a real treat. Uh, a lot of you had a chance to talk with Neil Bawa um, during the networking. Uh, he's gonna be presenting on multifamily fundamentals. And um, whether you're new to real estate investing or a seasoned veteran, I mean, Neil's approach to multifamily investing is so unique with his data-driven approach. So I'm really looking forward to that tonight. Uh, so we are recording this. It'll be available on YouTube. Uh, so when you checked in, we did capture your email address. So we'll be sending out both the uh, link for the recording and all the slides from the presentations tonight. So you'll get all that. Uh, so uh, feel free to take notes, but you'll get all the copies of everything. Um, so if you're not already familiar with the Multifamily University, uh, that's our, our community. Of, it's just a website full of all sorts of resources uh, related to real estate investing, uh, multifamily, uh, and it's 100% free. So please take advantage of that. Um, um, oh, I got a slide out of order. Uh, so with that being said, I want to introduce uh, Keegan. Um, so what we're trying to do with these meetups is we have great content to present, but we also want to start building community. Uh, that's why we have networking and social aspects before. And uh, we also want to invite other members of the community uh, to get involved. So uh, we run a big meetup in Sacramento and Keegan's presented there often. Um, and he's got a great take on what's going on with the country that we call State of the Union. So with that being said, here's Keegan. Cool. Thank you. Can I have the... Thank you. All right, thanks guys, in the opening act. Gotta hype up the room for the big man back there, you know? Um, hopefully I don't drop the ball. Speak up? Yeah. All right, uh, so like you said, I do a State of the Union, so it's kind of a 30,000 foot view of the US economy, what's going on in the country. All right, uh, but since I've never spoke to you guys, I just wanna introduce myself. So again, my name is Keegan. Uh, Boston born, go Pats, almost 20 years of domination, all right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, my background, probably a little unique. So I actually went into the Air Force out of college. I went on the aviation track and flew B-1 bombers. So that's the B-1. It's not the stealth one. Everyone always mixes that up. So I wanted to throw that out there. So I got about 2,500 hours over my career, about 1,500 in combat. And uh, my primary ground job, the one that I did the longest, was chief of training. So I was in charge of the training program for about 100 aviators, tracking all their training qualifications, combat qualifications, that sort of thing. So uh, implemented some systems with that and uh, that was my ground job. So, all right, uh, so in the Air Force, moved to South Dakota and I bought my first investment property. So I went the duplex house hacking route and that was kind of my intro to real estate. I didn't know anything about real estate, didn't know what a cap rate was, but it seemed to make sense. I think my girlfriend, at some point watched some HGTV and it, you know, was like, oh, that seems like a good idea. So, and it was. So a couple years later, bought another one and then another one. And uh, here we are today, right? Got the bug. Uh, after the Air Force, I actually took some time off. They wanted me to move back down to Texas. Uh, anybody ever hear of Abilene, Texas? Yeah, you guys know, it's like the armpit of America, right? So uh, I didn't want to move back there. So they say, join the Air Force, see the world. I saw Texas, South Dakota, and Qatar. So it wasn't really what I had in mind when I was uh, joining, right? So took some time off, traveled to Europe, lived in Munich for a bit, enjoyed myself. And then right about the time I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life, uh, we had the crypto boom of 2017, if you guys remember that. Bitcoin skyrocketed, it hit 20 grand. I was pretty fortunate because I started investing in cryptocurrency in about 2013. So I got in a good time. Uh, so I had a partial successful exit last year with that and still on some. Did you sell uh, when it was 20,000? What's that? Did you sell the Bitcoins when it was 20,000? Uh, not quite at 20,000. I, I got to be honest, it kind of caught me off guard because I treated it as a long term, almost like a retirement fund. I just oh, yeah. had them and said and forget it. So. I had to kind of do some logistics to, to set everything up and wasn't quite at 20,000, but it, it did okay, I guess. Um, I'm not complaining. And then, uh, so now I'm getting into, that's breaking the sound barrier, it's pretty cool. So that's a little bit of why, oh no. So now as I'm diving headfirst into the commercial real estate world, I actually just launched my own company a couple weeks ago, Mach One Equity. 
So a little nod to my uh, past there. And I've got a really good partner. That's my partner in crime right there. It's Leo. It's actually, if you own a dog, after you close on a property, make sure you bring them there because when they pee on the property, it's like a binding resolution, right? That you officially <laughs> own it. So just keep that in mind. All right, so that's enough about me. Um, let's get into the State of the Union. So you can't talk about the country without talking about our favorite reality TV star, Donald Trump, right? So what's been going on last week? What was the big thing that happened last week? Anybody paying attention? Tariffs and the rate cut. Those are two big things, right? At least as it pertains to my presentation, because that's what I prepped. So that's what we're talking about. So Trump has been pretty vocal about his uh, displeasure with the Fed. Uh, he's been wanting a rate cut for the better part of a year or you know, decade, whatever. So he wants rate cut. He wants rates low. Uh, the Fed pushed back for a while, but he finally got his wish, and they cut rate by a quarter of a point last week. So I want to talk about this going back to a few weeks ago. Jay Powell, the chairman of the Fed, he testified in front of Congress. He does uh, his mid-year update on monetary policy. So this has kind of said, shed some light on his mindset, how he approached this and what went into that decision. So a big thing that he talks about is inflation. So they're really targeting a 2% inflation rate. Uh, right now we're at about 1.6. So a few months ago, we were pretty pegged. We were at about 1.9%. Things were looking good. And then it drops uh, about a third of a point. So he is very aware that he, he doesn't want a muted inflation to be going on in America. He looks at, he brings up Japan a lot. They have really low inflation. I think it's like 0.3 or 0.4%. Um, so he's semi-aggressive about combating that and keeping us around 2%. Uh, and then he talks a lot about these economic cross currents. So the big one being trade war with China it causes a lot of volatility, volatility, excuse me, uh, a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace. So last week we had a quarter point rate cut. You would expect the market to go up as a result of that. But that coincided with the trade war. Trump put a 10% tariff on about $300 billion worth of goods. So we had the biggest single day loss uh, coming after that. So Kind of an interesting dynamic there. Those two are fighting each other. Um, and that was on top of a pre-existing 25% tariff on about $250 billion worth of goods. So uh, China's pretty unhappy. They said they're not going to buy any more agricultural products from us. So that's having a huge effect on the agricultural industry in the U.S. So I don't know, some uh, potentially scary things going on with the trade war. So just still some uncertainty. It's causing some volatility. Uh, he talks about just globally the economic growth concerns. There's kind of slowing down of global economic growth. So he looks at that and says, well, that could start to infect the US. So we need to get out in front of that. We need to be uh, proactive, not just reactive, right? And then within the US, there's been a marked decrease in business investment. So, um, you know, inventory is starting to decrease their cash management is starting to uh, change. There's a lot of that could be because of the trade war and just that uncertainty. So uh, he wants to kind of re-stimulate the economy. Um, he talks about the debt ceiling. I think it's probably a non-factor because reality, they're never gonna let us go into default. That would be like catastrophic, right? So, um, but it's interesting that we have to have that conversation again, right? It's like every few years. Um, so the big takeaway is he's looking to be accommodative with his monetary policy. Uh, he actually talks about jobs a fair amount, and specifically the people that are kind of at the lower rung of the job market, people that are really just now starting to feel the positive effects of this 10-year growth run we've had. So he wants them to keep having that positive effect. He wants the good times to continue. So um, quarter rate cut, quarter of a point. What's interesting is we're starting rate cuts at like 2.5. If you go back in history, that would be like where you would end up after a bunch of rate cuts. So we don't have much room to go in terms of rate cuts. So it'll be interesting to see how things develop. If, if the economy does run into uh, some actual serious problems, then I don't know, we may not have uh, many tools to fight it. But so this is uh, from the July jobs report. Unemployment was flat at 3.7%. So we're still kind of around those all time lows, which is good. But 
it's interesting. We're cutting rates when we have all, all, all time lows for unemployment, right? So something to think about. New job creation, we came in at about 160,000 this month. So it's just over the average for 2019. It's well below the average for 2018, which is about 225,000 a month. Um, we had a pretty worrisome month in May, just over 50,000, but June and July seem to have recovered a bit. So it'll be interesting to see how August and September come out and what the actual trend is, right? So I think with the jobs report, it's a snapshot in time. So it's really about the trend as you look at them. So, so I do this every, every month, I do this uh, discussion. Um, well, I think in January, this is maybe February, that was attributed to the government shutdown. So that was kind of an outlier. I, I don't know what the, if there was a specific causal factor for May. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that one, but. Sometimes yeah. Yeah. Flooding. Okay. So maybe just some part time. Okay. Um, Awesome. What is interesting is pretty much every report that comes out, they have revised the previous month's numbers down. So um, something, something to think about there. All right, switching gears, I wanted to do a little bit of a, a dive into the student loan crisis. This is some, a topic that I see come up a lot in meetups, but it's usually just like a one slide kind of overview. We're in a lot of trouble with the student loan crisis. So I wanted to dive into it. I didn't have student loans, so I kind of wanted to understand a bit for myself. So I'm going to share that with you. Uh, 44 million, that's the total number of people with student loan debt at a tune of 30,000 apiece. So that's the average level of debt for student loan borrowers. What's interesting is people graduating today in 2019, the average is about 40,000. So the problem's just getting worse. Uh, so the total debt is 1.5 trillion. So that's a big number. I have a hard time figuring out is that, like where, where are we at with that 1.5 trillion? Is that really bad? I, I don't know. So I wanted to compare it to uh, some national debt. So you can see it's bigger than the national debt of India, of Spain, um, the Netherlands, Norway. So it's it's a big number. When we're starting to talk about entire countries, national debt is smaller than our student loan debt in America, right? It's starting to get a bit out of hand. Um, so some of the things that to keep in mind with this forbearance, so this is similar to a deferment, but they're still making minor payments, but the balance is actually growing because they're below the minimum threshold to actually pay off the principal. So the balance is actually growing for 2.6 million people with about $111 billion worth of debt. So it's a big number. And then defaults, defaults are coming in at 5.1 million people are in default to the tune of 102 billion. So that's almost 11%. So that's a pretty significant default rate. If you remember in 2008, when, when we had the crash, only about 4% of single family homes mortgages went into default. On the commercial side, it's about 0.4%, but for single family homes, it's about 4%. And it, you know, we saw what that caused, right? So you just sit in 11%, something to be uh, concerned with. All right, and then I wanted to talk about this concept of kind of educational arbitrage and how that is factoring into the student loan crisis because it's kind of exasperating it. So there's a diminishing ROI of a college degree today compared to you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It doesn't mean as much as it used to. Um, so many people are graduating that it's kind of just watered it down. Um, so this chart looks at student loan debt in blue, median income for a bachelor's degree in red from 2003 to 2012. So it's a little out of date, but still relevant. So you can see student debt just took off and then the median income for graduate actually fell by about $4,000, $5,000. So that's not good. All right, this is actually from an interesting study that happened in 2015. They were looking at the difference in demographics between Uber drivers and taxi drivers. But what was interesting was in doing so, they found out 
that the education level for Uber and taxi drivers was pretty significant. About 40 something percent, 45 percent have a college education. Back in like 1971, it was like 1% of taxi drivers had a college education. So imagine sending your kid to college and then he's driving a taxi. It's not exactly what most people think of when they think of a job requiring a college degree because it doesn't require a college degree. So um, about 43 for every 100 people are underemployed when they graduate. So they're going into jobs like Uber where they don't actually require a degree. So because there's just not a lot of jobs available for them. So by 2020, there's gonna be 19 million more graduates. There's only gonna be 7 million new jobs requiring a college degree. So you can really see where that arbitrage comes through where we're just not creating enough jobs requiring a college degree. That's kind of what it comes down to. So, And then the effect that has on home ownership, obviously it's gonna delay their ability to save for a down payment. It could affect their credit score if they're in the 11% that are in default. And then it's gonna throw off their debt to income ratio. So, yeah, is that you? Yeah, uh, I just, I, I wanted to talk about the, the top one, the vacation auto wash college degree. Sure. I sold my son on a custom degree that I created for him because I, I, I told him college is an incredible experience in life and you learn a great deal. Mm -hmm. but it's absolutely horrific for helping you find a career or a job. It's so disconnected from what the American business wants. Mm -hmm. Mm. But you would not really get a job out of college. I mean, it's not like the 80s. Yeah. It seems like there's a massive disconnect with right. what the average American employer wants. I mean, Facebook is much happier with somebody that has two months of coding training than four years of degree. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to publish that custom degree online. I have a lot of people ask me about what are the components of this degree. He is going to retake a four year degree. Is it multifamily you? Is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting because if you think about it, colleges used to sell you a degree. Now they kind of sell an experience, right? It's all about like the amenities. Here's the dining hall. We've got 15 chefs on staff and this amazing pool. And every student gets a one, two bedroom suite to themselves. It's kind of, it's more about the experience that they're selling on their campus versus here's what you can actually get with your degree. It doesn't get talked about as much, so cool. All right, I'll skip that. Cool, all right, thanks guys. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is our first multifamily U branded meetup in Fremont. We've been running meetups here for eight years, uh, but, and some of you, like Juan, have been coming to them for years. Um, they were on the other side of the freeway, and uh, there's, a, there's a college there called Unitech College, and you see signs on the freeway on 880 uh, or 680 for Unitech College, and it's part of my story. So before I get started with multifamily fundamentals, this is actually a horribly named presentation. It should be multifamily deep dive, but it does st start with about 10 slides of the fundamentals of multifamily. But let me start you off by telling you a little bit about me. So uh, I'm a technologist, um, and... Uh, I started off as a software engineer, and uh, unlike most people that get into single, uh, into uh, you know, into real estate with a single family rental, I started in reverse. So my first experience of real estate was building a five million dollar campus that is 400 yards away. So if you just go on the other side on Auto Mall, it's basically at the first light. It's the Grimmer and Auto Mall light. And you see this beautiful campus there. So it's a, it's a 27,000 square foot campus. I was running the business. I was chief operations officer. And in 2003, my boss gave me this bad news that General Motors, who was our landlord, they were about that way, two miles that way, had decided that they didn't want to continue with us. We were a technology education company. And so every week, we'd have a whole bunch of students. And they would mess up their carpet. So GM really hated us. And so they gave us notice, right? And we had nine months and four days left, and after that, they would have charged us $10,000 a day as, as fines. So my boss goes off, 
and he's like, I'm just gonna buy a campus, we're making lots of money and we need tax protection. I'm like, you go boss, I'm running the company. He comes back three days later and it's like, I put a deposit down on a place here, you know, two miles away and, and it's 27,000 square feet and it's beautiful and it's, you know, the ceilings are high, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like super excited. So I jump into his car and we go off to this place and from the outside it looks really good. And I'm like, wow, this is great. This is gonna be so awesome for our business. And he opens the door and inside, it's basically ceilings 22 feet high and a concrete pad that's 27,000 square feet. And my jaw hit the floor three times and bounced off. I was like, what the heck is this, right? And then I'm like, boss, we have nine months and four days. What is this, right? Where's, where's my office? I need classrooms, I need spaces, we need to teach. And he's like, no, 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 you'll build it. And I'm like, do you mean you build, you'll build it? No, 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 you'll build it, Neil. And I'm like, but I don't know the first thing about real, you know, real estate, right? All I own is a single family home. And he's like, no, you'll figure it out. I'm gonna give you a retired general contractor. He's gonna help you through the process. So that, that started a nine month and four day process during which I think I got nine hours of total sleep. So I'd you know, run the business from basically from eight to six and from six to about two in the morning or three in the morning, we'd basically be building this building. And I, I cussed and complained and whined for nine straight months about this not being my job. And once it was done, I've been thanking him for the, the, for the last, you know, whatever, 15, 16 years. Because you learn such an insane amount when you build a building from scratch. You learn about egress and air conditioning and heating systems and, you know, room densities. For example, we know that if a, I know that if a fire marshal just walked into this room right now, he would shut us down. We've got too many people in this room, right? The fact that we have two doors might save us. So... Things like that were, were an incredible learning, even though I was running this tech company. So two years, three years later, we ran out of uh, that space. Our company was growing so fast, we used up the entire 27,000 square feet. And the building behind us was available for sale. It was 33,000 square feet, so it was mar much larger, and it was more expensive. But this time, we actually didn't have the cash to just buy the whole building. So I go to my boss and I'm like, I'm desperate, I need more space, we can't grow. And he's like, well, let's go buy this other building. And I'm like, but we don't have all the money. He's like, no, you're gonna go raise the money. My boss loved giving me these impossible things to do. Like he was just like, oh, you know, Neil, we'll, you'll figure it out. So I'm like, okay, how the heck am I going to figure this one out? Well, as it happened, I knew a bunch of doctors and they, all, they were all in Fremont, they're part of the Washington healthcare system. And these are really rich doctors and they invest in real estate. So I came up, came up with this crazy idea that I would take that 33,000 square foot shell building, I would chop it up into 2,000 square foot suites and then have a big suite for us, 13,000 square feet. And I would tell the doctors that each of you buy this 2,000 square foot suite and I'll build it for you, right? Because right now it's just a shell, right? But I'm gonna build it for you as a beautiful office suite. And when it's done, I'll rent it back from you right? And here's my financials. So I figured that if I get nine or 10 of these doctors together in a room, at least a couple of them would buy shares. Each share was a 2,000 square foot suite, and at least it would, it would help me get on my way. So I, I gather them all in a room in my Unitech College, you know, uh, conference room, and I pitch this to them. And I notice a bunch of them are smiling, right? Then they start asking me a bunch of questions about fees and those sorts of things. I'm like, no, 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 we're just building a building. You know, we're gonna build it and then, then you guys will rent it back to us. So they, they're smiling and then they're like, okay, we wanna think about it. So they sent me outside the room and I'm like, you know, they're probably thinking I'm a total idiot and blah, blah, blah. Nobody's gonna actually want to do this. So I come back in and every single one of those doctors buys a suite right? Without discussion, without bargaining, they all buy a suite. By this time, I'm thinking I must be the greatest salesperson on earth, right? Because these guys have like met me once or twice, and they want to buy these super expensive suites from me. So I'm like, I must be awesome, right? What I don't realize is I'm a total idiot. Because what I should have done is for a $9 million building, I should have charged a 5% development fee. Because that's what every real estate developer charges, a 5% fee. They were just making sure that I wasn't charging any fees. That I didn't want a 30-70 split. A 30-70 split is about two or three million bucks. And they just wanted to convince themselves that I was dumb enough not to be charging any of those fees. But what was nice is that even though I know this, not for a moment did I ever regret doing that because my business exploded with that second building and we were able to sell it in 2013 at class leading valuations. I mean, Unitech College set the bar for the, for the business multiples in our entire industry. And so what's interesting is that even though I wasn't a real estate guy, real estate was an incredible part of my story. So when I did that in 2007, one of the doctors had to drop out, so I took his suite. 
And then I notice that my tax bill is dropping. So I go back to my, my CPA and I say, why is my tax bill dropping? It's like depreciation, right? So he explains this magic word called depreciation to me and I'm like, wow, right? I had this big fat tech salary and so I was paying 53% in taxes, but all of a sudden I was paying 30%, right? Because this suite was basically bringing my taxation down. I was like, this is, this is truly awesome, right? How do I do more of it? So in 2008, 2009, you know, all the, 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 the real estate crash happens and all kinds of bad things are happening, and I'm doing research. So I'm researching all this real estate stuff because guess what? My experience with real estate has been awesome. Everybody else's was horrible at that point in time, but mine was awesome, so I wanted to buy real estate. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm a data guy. I'm, I'm a data scientist, so I'm like, how can I use data and do a better job of buying all these buildings? So I'm looking on, on, the, on the internet, and there's this website called Zillow. Obviously, everybody knows Zillow now, but back then they weren't as popular. And this website published a list of all the cities in the US, including how much they had crashed from 2005 highs to late 2008 lows, right? So they, 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 they documented that crash. And so there were like 1,000 cities in there. So I basically pay somebody 50 bucks to mine that data and put it together in Excel and sort it for me. So they do that, some guy on Fiverr.com, by the way, if you haven't heard of it, it's the most amazing website, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Uh, we use Fiverr at least twice a day, I kid you not, twice a day for different things, right? So we do about six, 700 gigs a year on Fiverr.com, so check it out. So I pay somebody, he does this stuff, he sorts it for me. As it turns out, the city that had dropped the most in the US actually happened to be in California. I'm like, awesome, this is great, right? And it's a city called Madeira. Right, M-A-D-E-R-A, it's, it's 22 miles north of Fresno. The math made perfect sense, so the next day I get into my car, my wife and I get into the car, we drive 144 miles from Fremont to Madeira, and we check out this place, and we realize why the price had dropped a lot. It was an agricultural community in the middle of nowhere, right, so all around there were farms, and then 22 miles later there's Fresno, right? So what had happened is Kaufman and Broad had basically built 5,000 homes and sold them for $250,000 each to a bulk of bunch of farm workers who all said that they had, you, you know, that those were the days of stated uh, income. So according to the farm workers, they were all making six figures, right? Well, when 2008 happened, all these brand new four bedroom, be beautiful stone facade homes had nobody owning them. So I go in there, I look at the homes, I do my analysis, my analysis clearly states that this is great, there's, there's all these people in Fresno that are paying a lot and they wanna come here, and this is only 20 minutes away, right? There's no traffic on that freeway uh, 99 going back to, um, to Fresno. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make more than a thousand bucks. And so I do the math, I buy one, I wait for a month, I make sure that it gets rented up easy, and then I buy nine more, because they only allow you to buy 10, right? That's the maximum number that you can buy. So I buy 10 of those, the next month, my family stops talking with me because they think I'm, I'm the stupidest person on earth. And, and they're like, this, this is crazy, the sky is falling, you're dumb, blah, 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 blah. So each month, and, and now we use WhatsApp, but back then we were using some, something else for uh, family communication, I keep posting my profits. Five months later, my family goes and buys 50 homes in Madeira. 50. Five zero, right? Because there's a whole bunch of them. My, my family's like a clan, right? We're like the mafia. So. <laughs> They basically, they, 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 you know, they, when they, they try and beat like all of my mathematical ideas, they try and beat the shit out of it. Right now they're beating the shit out of my college degree for my kids, so we'll see how that goes. So, so they, they beat the shit out of me. I, I would keep posting the profits. Eventually after five months they were like, okay, this must work. So they go out and we, you know, we buy a whole bunch of these homes. So, so now, you know, I realized you can't go beyond 10. There's no way to go beyond 10, except that in about three or four months, I realized that some people seem to have 14 or 16. I realized that if you refinance and get your wife off, she can also have 10. So then I go off to Chicago. I go there and, and this time I'm like, I'm not buying single units, I'm gonna buy triplexes, right? That way I get three for the price of one, right? That seemed to make all the sense in the world, but it, it ended badly for me because Guess what? I only did the math on what each tenant was making and, or paying and how much the units cost. What I didn't do is I didn't look at the area quality. At that point, I was overconfident. I thought that you know, anything that I touch would turn into gold, actually turned into crap. And that's what happened in Chicago. So all kinds of really bad things happened in Chicago. And um, essentially, the problem was I was getting the exact rents that I had you know, underwritten. And the, the price was fantastic. I was paying maybe 40 cents on the dollar because I was buying them from banks. So, right, they were really cheap, right? But the problem was, every third or fourth month, my tenant would stop paying. 
right? And then it would take me five months to evict that tenant. It would cost me thousands and thousands of bucks, and then I had to rehab the property, and then it would take me another couple of months to get a new tenant in there. So basically, I had 50% vacancy in my properties, and I had to go and find the right tenant. In Chicago, in South Chicago, very, very difficult to find that needle in a haystack tenant that's awesome. So I looked at that and I said, oh, I'm screwed. I just put you know, a little over a million and a half in here. I think I've lost all of my money because I have to sell these basically at, at prices much lower than I purchased them at. So I said, maybe there's another way to get around it. Right? So I start talking to my property manager and the property manager says, look, right now I want to put up somebody in there, there's, there's vacancy. I wish, I wish I had 10 times the lead flow, tenant lead flow. And if I did that, I could pick the right person, that one person that's perfect. I could find them if I had 10 times the light lead flow. So of course, I immediately started to think, how am I going to get 10 times the lead flow, right? So what I do is I basically work with a, I start looking at all these websites, Zillow and Trulia and rent.com and show me the rent.com and a whole bunch of them, like there were 29 of them. And I start figuring out how to hack these sites. So I hack a few of them and then I realize I need a professional. So I go to a, a Ukrainian hacker. <laughs> And, uh, and I hire him on Fiverr.com, and I basically say, please don't inject any code. There is this thing called the FBI in the US. I don't want to attract their attention. But other than that, you can do whatever the hell you want, figure out how to hack all these websites. I want to get a huge number of tenant leads. So he does it in about two months and $78. I think I paid him 78 bucks, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but, but so he was, uh, he was my best friend for a while. So I paid him 78 bucks. They, he basically sent me a piece of code and uh, I paid another guy who would basically keep uh, repeating that piece of code in a browser and boom, I had massive numbers of leads. All of my Chicago properties filled up. I was at 100% occupancy. So they, they, they were never as profitable as the Californian properties, but you know, I, I, I've done fairly well there. So I, I just didn't like the fact that the, the um, tenancy was bad. So then I looked at that and I said, okay, this is great, but I don't want to do more of this because this was too much work, right? And I'm basically doing a bunch of jury rigged things. There's got to be an easier way to do this. So this is late 2010. And so I go, okay, so what happens when people run out of 10 homes, right? There must be a better way to scale. I have all this money that's coming from my technology business. Well, how do I scale this? And so in late 2010, I discovered this thing called multifamily syndications where you have a bunch of people, 30, 40, 50, or sometimes 500 people, investing small amounts of money, 25, 50, $100,000 each, and buying these mega properties. Sometimes the property is like 20 million, sometimes it's 100 million dollars. So I was like, wow, this is really cool, right? This is scale, right? This is amazing because this property actually has five or six full-time employees that work there, and half of them even live at the property. Right? So you've got this amazing level of control that I didn't have in all of these sorts of things. So of course, I immediately go and invest you know, I, I put $100,000 each into like 16 different syndications, right? And I do that over five or six months. I do my research. I pick all these great syndicators. And I'm thinking 1.6 million, 8%. I'm going to be making $120,000, you know, um, in, in cash flow, right? I'm going to be good. This is all going to work out. Of course, it didn't. So a year later, I've made $0. Right? And I'm like, why? This, is, this, this was the right thing to do. Multifamily was amazing. Well, the answer was, all the properties that I invested in were amazing. All of those were fantastic, happy ending stories that made me truck loads of money. The problem was in 2010 and 11 was the one bad year that multifamily had. Why? Because people were living with their parents. People were living in their cars, in trailer parks, in mobile homes, right? They were not paying rent. And so a lot of these properties were vacant. And by vacant, I, mean, I don't mean they were at zero. I mean they were at 85. So they're meeting their mortgage and maybe paying 1% to the investors. But what I really wanted was 8% or 10%, which is what they'd promised. So I go to a bunch of these syndicators. There's 13 of them. Uh, so I write them letters, actual letters. You heard about those things, like physical letters? So I write letters to each one of them, and I basically say, look, you know, I, I have my own portfolio of these 45 units, and I've learned a lot of digital marketing, and I gave you $100,000. You're not giving me any cash flow. The property, I, each month you send me this, this email saying, well, we are still at 85%, so we're not going to pay distributions. I'm going to help you. I know your property is not marketed properly because, and I sent them nice screenshots, like this letter was like seven pages printed in color. I'm like, you should be here, you should be here, you should be here, look at all these websites, right? Five of them never reply back. Eight of them are like, firstly, how the hell did you find these websites and how do we get on there? I'm like, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm an investor with you, I gave you 100 grand, I'm trying to, for free, teach your people how to do this. And they're like, 
Awesome. Let's get started tomorrow. So in 2011, in the evenings, I am marketing a $2 billion portfolio that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to all these other people, right? And so I'm marketing all this stuff and going to all these weird websites. You've never even heard of most of these websites, like showmetherent.com. And um, I don't know, like it's a crazy list, right? The list eventually expanded to like 60 or 70 websites and we figured out how to hack the vast majority of them. And some of them were really simple hacks. People are thinking, what kind of hack is he talking about, right? What, he, what is he doing? Like he's you know, doing the same thing that the Russians did in the 2016 election. Nothing as complicated as that, right? It was stuff like, um, like rentlinks.com, you know, it only allows you to put one address in. But at the end of the address, if you put a hash in, and then put whatever number you feel like, it thinks it's a new address. Stuff like that. So instead of having one listing for my property, I had 200 listings. So I had a massive, a humongous number of leads. And I think uh, in 2011, we might have generated more, more like 40 or 50,000 leads for those properties. Six months later, the properties went from an average of 81% occupancy to 97, right? So I went from having zero dollars in cash flow to having well over $10,000 a month, right? So I was at maybe 12 or 13 grand. So I was really happy. And I thought that this was going to be the end of it. It's like, oh, I, I, you know, we've gotten through the recession. The properties anywhere are getting better. The market's getting better. Now I'm just going to keep investing my passive money, and I'll be happy. But what happened, interestingly enough, was those people came back to me and said, what do you want, Neil? You helped us. Hundreds of our investors have been helped. What do you want? And I'm like, hmm, what do I want? You know, I wasn't sure. But then I was, I was like, well, in two years, my senior partner, who, uh, you know, he was a senior partner. I had a, a minority uh, ownership in Unitech. He was looking to retire because he's in his 70s now. And he wanted to just sell the business. So I'm like, well, I mean, I sell the business. I'm going to have millions and millions of dollars that I need to invest somewhere. So I basically went back to those guys and said, look, if I helped you, I want to learn everything that you know about multifamily. I want to learn everything, asset management, property management, acquisitions. I want to learn the whole gamut. And they're like, we don't teach anybody anything, but you're welcome to come and sit in our, our weekly meetings. And you'll learn a lot. And you can ask as many questions as you want, and we'll answer all of them. So they thought, maybe I'll come once, right? I'm a very stubborn sort of character. So. Uh, in 2011 and 2012, I sat in 275 of these meetings, right? I got permission from my boss, so I was doing it during the day. So I was sitting in basically four a week for four different companies, and then the next week it would be another four companies. So imagine sitting in all these amazing meetings, learning from all these professionals that had done multifamily for 10, 20, 30 years on a portfolio that was over $2 billion, Right? It was an insane level of learning. I was learning crazy stuff. I've never seen this stuff in a podcast or a webinar or a, or a course because these people are not in the business of teaching anybody. As far as they're concerned, this is all great stuff that they know and they don't want anybody else to learn. What was even better was that I realized that they were actually good at different things. Like, this guy is awesome at rehab. This guy is really good with lipstick on a pig. He makes his property look better. This person's really good at buying cheap. This person's great at demographics and figuring out where to buy. They were actually only good at little things, but I was able to see all of it because I was invested in all of them and they were all sharing whatever they knew with me. So I was learning incredible things that I realized nobody else had access to. So I was like, okay, I still have a year and a half or two years to go before my company is sold. I need to remember all this stuff. How am I going to do that? So I opened a meetup group. So in 2011, we opened a meetup group inside Unitech College, 400 yards away. And we've been running that meetup every month for the last nine years. So two years before I sell my company in 2013, I was in a room like this teaching people all the stuff that I was learning. And you're going to learn these um, you know, over the next year because we're doing a, an entire series of the, these classes. And people are learning amazing stuff. And they, at the end of the presentation, they would come up to me and say, so Neil, what are you doing in real estate? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm a passive investor in real estate. You're standing inside my business. I run this technology business. And they're like, you know, but we're hoping to invest with you. And I'm like, well, at this point, I don't have anything to, to share. And they're like, whenever you do, we'd like to invest with you. So they would give me their name, and I would write it down. So over two years, can you imagine how long that list got? It, get, it got to hundreds and hundreds of investors. So when I finally transitioned in 13, 14, and 15, it took me a little bit of time because we had what is known as a golden parachute. So we had some number of hours 
after 13 that we still had to show up at work, but we didn't have to do much. Um, so we're basically doing real estate in the office, and my boss knew it, and he was perfectly fine with it because he knew I was transitioning out. My job was just to make sure that all the people that I'd hire were, were the new people they were taking over. So we went through that process, and when I started buying these buildings, and I bought a bunch of them, so we've now bought 15 buildings, purchased, bought or building 15 different buildings. They're about 2,200 units. The total value when all the construction is done is close to $300 million. And there's more than 500 investors already invested and about 1,300 more that are looking to invest, that are actively here, including a, a number of you here. And so a lot of this stuff sounds scripted, but it sort of just happened, right? We were just trying to figure out what's best and react to the situation, and it sort of led to this interesting and amazing story. So to give back, we continue teaching our meetups. I also teach courses online that are free on udemy.com. So if you check out udemy.com slash real focus, you'll notice that there's about 10,000 people taking analytics courses. This one's uh, particularly interesting because this actually was the first presentation that we ever taught. It's changed a lot in, that in, the, in the time. But multifamily fundamentals, I talk about why people are looking at multifamily. It doesn't matter if you're looking to invest with other people or you're looking to buy multifamily. There's a, a few reasons why people are doing that. And then I'm going to give you a little introduction to this $2 trillion US multifamily market. Trillion with a T. That's $2,000 billion. We don't think of the multifamily market as being so huge, but it's, it's actually the largest asset class in America, not counting single family, because obviously single family is a bunch of different people. But this as an asset class is the largest in the United States. We're going to talk about the trends that are driving absolutely insane multifamily growth, especially since 2008. We're going to explain how groups of investors buy these properties together. Can we get some more ventilation in here? It's warm. Uh, we're going to talk about different reasons to invest in multifamily, why people have been investing in multifamily for guess how long. Do you know how long people have been buying multifamilies? Any guesses? 15 years? So the first multifamily was built in England in the 10th century AD. So this is, uh, we've been investing in multifamily for about 1,100 years. So we're going to go through a, a quick life cycle of a multifamily project. What does that project look like? What, what is a typical multifamily project like? And we'll do a quick review at the end. So disclaimer, we're not investment advisors. All investment involve risk. Please read investment docs carefully. We're not going to show you any, but read them carefully. Feel free to accept or re uh, reject uh, investment recommendations. A recommendation is not a, not a guarantee for a successful performance. And never invest your money on our recommendation alone. All right, let's get started. The big why and how. I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm going to give you the answers to some of those questions. The first question is, why must anyone, you, anyone expand their portfolio beyond stocks and bonds. Today, we're hearing more and more about the world going into what is known as zero bound for interest rates. The US is the only developed country in the world today that has positive interest rates. Germany, negative. Switzerland, negative. Japan, negative. We don't count China in there still because it's a developing country and so is India. But if you look at the developed world, Everyone is crossing the zero bound and not in a good way. Because of that, tens of trillions of bonds are now becoming basically not paying any anything. In Germany, if I want to lend money for 30 years to the German government, I have to pay to the German government so I can lend them money at no interest for 30 years. That is the kind of stupid world that we live in. And that's why you have to expand your portfolio beyond stocks and bonds. We're going to talk about that. And then why must you seek higher yields? So one of the, the, the things that we are taught in our system is be afraid of taking risk. And what I am finding is it's a lie. It's a bunch of people that lie to you for their own good because they want you to buy expensive 401k packages or some kind of a retirement account or a Vanguard account that basically is charging you fees regardless of whether you make money or not. Actually, what's that? Or, uh, yeah, exactly. A any kind of annuity has very high fees. Some of them have ridiculous fields. The challenge is that this is a question that's very important. Throughout your life, 
The only risk that you don't want to take is not taking risks. Because you, if you don't take risks and you don't look for higher yields, you end up in a retirement where you basically have one-tenth of what you need to survive. That's what's happening to more and more Americans. And we're going to talk about how you can invest in real estate passively. My, my way is only one of them. There's 10 different ways of investing in real estate passively. So this question here, why must you expand your portfolio beyond stocks and bonds? In my mind, there's many answers to this, but this is the biggest one. The answer is staring us in the face, and that is this system, our social security system and retirement system, was actually designed for a completely different reality, completely different time. Three reasons. Number one, life expectancy. If you look at your great-great-grandpa, he worked until the ripe old age of 49 in the year 1900, and he worked until the day he died. By 1960, people were living to the age of 69, so retirement, Social Security, had to last a few years, from 65 to 69. Today, we're living to 79. Women are living to 83. And that age is expected to increase due to the incoming healthcare revolutions. The next 20 years are a healthcare revolution. Now your retirement has to last decades. But they designed the program in the 50, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and no changes have been made to Social Security since then to make it better. The second reason, I love this chart, this is our healthcare expenditures. So from the 1960s, if you look at real increases, we've seen a 16% increase in wages. We've seen 168% in the US's GDP. We've seen an 818% increase in our healthcare costs. You know what's worse? The vast majority of these come in the last decade of your life when you're trying to reduce your, your income. You, you, you want to slow down. You want to make less money because the pursuit of money is not as important when you're in your 60s and 70s. The vast majority of these come in that last decade. That's why things are so upside down. And then the stock market, right? So obviously, the last couple of days have been horrible for the stock market. But if you look at the last 18 years, from Jan 1st, 2001, to December 31st, 2018, and you adjust for inflation, and you include dividends. So you do all of that. How much money do you think one buck in the stock market has turned into? Well, a buck has now turned into $1.86. $1 has not yet, after 18 years, turned to $2, right? So if you save a few thousand dollars, and you invest it for 18 years, and it turns into basically double that amount, how does that add up? to thousands of dollars a month in retirement. How does that even add up to hundreds of dollars a month in retirement? The stock market simply does not make enough for you to retire or even get close to retiring because the overall returns, the overall yields in the stock market are very, very low. Most people are like, I am doing better. That's a common fall fallacy. Sit down with me for 18 years. I'm gonna ask you five or six questions and we're gonna do five minutes of math. I wanna see if you actually did better than this number. So anybody that wants to try, let's do it at the end of this presentation. So what do you do to get ahead? Well, the first thing I want you to remember is there's this magic law called compounding. Warren Buffett talks about the power of compounding. Compounding is the process of you know, taking two bucks, right, turning it into four, and then not buying a Tesla with that four bucks. right? Go in and reinvest it and make it eight, and then make it 16 and make it 32. That's compounding. right? So hopefully you get that 2x compounding. And that compounding effect is incredibly powerful. So here's how powerful it is. If you invest $100 for 30 years, and you invest it at three completely different levels of returns, here's what that money turns into. You invest 100 bucks at 2%. After 30 years, your 100 bucks is still not 200 bucks. It's, it's right around 182 bucks. That resembles the US stock market, by the way. At 10%, it's a lot better. 100 bucks turns into 2,000. But if you do the math on that, that's still not enough to retire. And the next slide will prove it to you, right? 1,984 is what you end up with after 30 years. Here's what happens when you jump from 10 to 18. This is why I say not taking risk is the greatest risk of all. Because at 18%, your 100 bucks is $21,000. Now notice. This graph is not the way that most people would look at it. It's not linear. 
This graph is what is known as exponential. The human mind has trouble with exponential. We are designed to do lean, linear math. Exponential math is very difficult to do. That's why we don't understand the power of a lot of these dot coms, because dot coms have exponential growth, right? This is exponential. So let me give you another example. If we flip that around, let's flip it around, right? How much do you need to save each month so that you have 15,000 a month in passive income 20 years from now? 15,000 a month might seem a lot, well, in the Bay Area, I, I, actually, it doesn't seem like a lot. But some of you might think, well, I don't need 15,000 a month. But in 20 years, because of inflation, 15 grand is more like seven, right? So if you want 15 grand a month in passive income 20 years from now, how much do you need to save each month? Well, remember we did the 2%, 10%, 18? Well, at 2%, you need to save $30,000 a month. At 10%, it's better. At 10%, you need to still save $2370 in post-tax. That's $30,000 a year. The vast majority of people do not save $30,000 a year, right? And successfully invest it at 10%. That doesn't happen. There's very few of us, right? Again, I challenge you, over 20 years, find me one person that actually has done this successfully. So what we really need to look at is 18%. At 18%, you need to invest $433 a month and you'll end up here in 20 years. This is the power of compounding combined with the power of risk taking. That is why it's not about real estate. It is about taking risk. Maybe your vehicle is something else. Maybe it's Bitcoin. I'm not suggesting it should be Bitcoin. But not taking risk is the greatest risk of all. Hmm? Why is 18% a magic number? 18% is a magic number because there are vehicles, not just real estate, but number of vehicles that target that in the higher risk category. So the institutional world, when it divides its assets into buckets, says bonds will make me 2%, and X will make me 6, and this will make me 12, and this will make me what? They don't go beyond 18 Right, so the highest risk, big risk category. I mean, they, they, there's, there's a few that go beyond 18, but the big buckets, the bucket that is considered the strongest today that everybody seems to be gravitating to, towards is 18. In the, this slide, right, the 2,000 per month in passive, mm -hmm. does that assume that you're making 18% at that time too? Uh, it assumes that you made 18% on $473 a month for 20 straight years. Now, is that likely to happen? No. But I think the point was to give you an example of what is possible if you managed it, right? I'm not suggesting that people can actually make 18% a year for 20 years. The only asset class that makes 18% a year for 20 straight years is timber, T-I-M-B-E-R. Timber is the greatest asset class in the world, but it also requires the greatest amount of patience. So uh, you talked about the 2% uh, the Sure. Uh, articles about if you just invest in index funds, mm -hmm. say S and P five hundred sure. index funds, the, top, uh, the rule of seventy two every nine years your money will double. That was in inflation adjusted. So you got to take inflation out of it because inflation is a killer of wealth. Inflation, when, when, when every year the, the dollar inflates by 2%, your purchasing power declines by 2%, right? So that was inflation adjusted. It wasn't really 2%, it was more like 2.9, whatever, right? So, so the, you have to look at the math. I'll, I'll, uh, this slide deck is being sent to you. The bottom was a link. Click on it, and you'll be able to answer your question. So here's what I do. I have found a way that works for me and works for my investors. So I'm, I'm a founder at Grow Capitus and Multifamily U. Multifamily U is our education company. Grow Capitus is our investment company. We source, negotiate, and buy commercial properties across the US. And more and more these days, we build them because we cannot buy them at reasonable prices. Current portfolio, we just crossed 2,000 units. We're looking to actually, I think we're going to cross 3,000 in less than 12 months. We now have 500 investors in, invest in our portfolio. Our properties are in nine states, actually, correction, with. Um, with Washington states, we're now at 10 states. Um, I speak at a lot of different events across the US. There's about 20 uh, conferences that I teach at, and all of them I'm really talking about the same concepts, the, these educational concepts that are extremely powerful. And you really don't have to invest with us. 
Everything that I just told you applies to whether you invest with us or not. It's really about understanding the sort of risk that you're taking when you don't take action. So this is our portfolio. As you can see, it's very diverse, right? This is a Class C building. This is another Class C building. This is a Class A brand new construction student housing. It's, I think this is a $50 million project. This is a really ugly building. You should look at it now. We've turned it, completely rehabbed it, external and internal, and it is on sale for about $8 million more than we paid. Um, another Class C building, a Class B project. This is actually a very nice Class B project. And then definitely a Class C minus. So you can see this is a, this is a 70s building. So we're looking at all of these different asset classes, trying to figure out how to improve them and get cash flow for our investors. Our goal is how to be double investor money in five years. And there's, as you can see, there's different models, right? Completely different models to do that. So let's give you a quick primer to multifamily itself. The term multi should mean more than one. It doesn't mean that. It means more than five, uh, more than four, right? So anything over four is considered multifamily. Uh, one, two, three, and four are considered single family assets. Why? Because you buy them based on your income and your credit. Whereas the moment you switch to five, you can have a bankruptcy and buy a five unit. So my partner, or ex-partner, John Mark, one of the, the things that he used to say at meetups is he basically said in 1982, he tried to buy a single family. He didn't have the credit to make it work, so he bought a sixplex. <laughs> right? So true story, he still lives in that sixplex, and now he's rented out five of those units for the last, I don't know, 20, 32, 33 years. So, True economies of scale, also known as institutional class multifamily, is at 150. Why 150? Because at 150, you have three employees. And those three employees are extremely important to have at the property to have true passive income, right? Uh, property manager, maintenance guy, leasing agent, those people, three people work at the property at 150. Obviously, as you go up to 250, you're at five people, so you have more scalability. At, at, at 350, you've got even more scale. How do we value them? Very differently from single family, right? So, I was gonna use this example, but this is, this, this is better. So, let's say there's two single families next to each other, and they're exactly the same. They look exact, no, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so they look exactly the same, and uh, exactly the same size, same age. What would happen is, if this one sold for $700,000, you could immediately say that this one's worth 700. This is known as comps, right, single family. And multifamily things are different, right? You've got two multifamilies, they're sitting next to each other, right? And one of them is 90% occupied, the other one is 40% occupied, right? Even though they're identical to each other, if this one sold for a certain price, you cannot apply this price to the other one because its income is lower. So in multifamily, prices are based on net operating income. And this is why multifamily tends to do better in a recession than single family. Because if a recession happens, rents don't fall by 50%. Rents in the Great Recession fell by 2.5% in the entire Great Recession. Not 2.5% a year, 2.5% total, right? Because that's, that's the typical. Rents are inflexible. They tend not to drop. Occupancy dropped. So some people, their, their income dropped by 10, 15, 20%. But rents did not drop in the US. So as a result, uh, multifamily tends to do significantly better than single family in a recession. Now recently I started hearing in podcasts that class C multifamily does really well in a recession. That is nonsense. Class, every class of, of renting real estate will suffer in a recession. But what is true is that multifamily real estate tends to bounce back very quickly after a recession ends and goes back to its original trend line, where single family prices take six to seven years to get back to the original trend line. It takes a long time to get back, back onto the original trend line. So you're digging a much bigger hole on the single family side. So this, this example here is the real magic of multifamily. What I'm about to show you is not an exaggeration, it's not an edge case. It happens 100% of the time. You have a 200 unit multifamily. You do a good job, and you raise the rents of each unit, each, um, you know, each door, by 25 bucks, 25 bucks a month. Believe it or not, the value of that property has now gone up by a million dollars. A million bucks, every time, all the time. In the Bay Area, 1.5 million. Every single time. 200 units, multiplied by 25, multiplied by 12 months, 
divided by something known as a six cap. Most properties in the US at this point for class C are six cap. Most properties in the Bay Area are four cap. So in the Bay Area, this number would turn to 1.5 million. But here, a million dollars of value has increased. It is possible, and some people have done this, to walk into a multifamily, raise rents by 25 bucks, and sell for a million dollars more a couple of weeks later. Now, in practice, it's impossible because people already have rent contracts signed, so it takes at least one year to raise rents. But what we've seen often is that over a year, people have raised that number by 50 or $75 and made three million bucks and walked, right? They're not even changing loans. The new guy coming in is assuming an existing loan. He's just taking over your loan when he's taking over a property. This is not something that is possible in any other asset class in the world. There are, you know, if you take over like a gas station, that number is going to be like a 10. If you take over uh, businesses, that number is going to be like a 15 or a 20 or a 30. Six cap, five cap, four cap only exists in institutional cl classes such as multifamily. Or in some cases, if you're buying an office in San Jose, you'll probably still get a five or six cap for it, right, in certain areas. But in the United States, you get multifamily everywhere, and this magic, this incredible magic of bumping rents by just 25 bucks works everywhere. Loans are also based on income and occupancy. So my, my partner, my ex-partner, John Mark, had a bankruptcy in 2008. We, between 2014 and 16, we bought $100 million worth of real estate. I was a junior partner because I was fairly new in real estate. I didn't have, it, I, I didn't have the, 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 the uh, resume that he had. So I had to submit his resume to every single lender. And the lender saw the bankruptcy on there. And we bought $100 million worth of real estate. But he couldn't have bought a single family home during that time. So one of the things I wanted to point out is, with multifamily, lenders are your friend. Ryan decides, after listening to my presentation, he's going to go off and he's going to buy, put an offer on a 250 unit. He doesn't know what he's doing. So instead of buying it for 20 million, he puts an offer in for 25, right? On a single family basis, if there was a $25 million single family next to it, the bank would immediately give him a loan, as long as he could afford it. You can't do that for multifamily because they will charge you tens of thousands of dollars to scrutinize your property. If you think getting a single family loan is hard, try multifamily. They will scrutinize your property and then come back and say, Ryan, this property is only worth 20 million bucks. Here's how we figured it out. And we're not gonna give you a loan higher than 75% of 20 million bucks. So lenders are actually our friends because single family is an emotional purchase. People buy single families because they want to live in them. People buy multifamilies because they want to make money. This is a cutthroat, emotionless, logical business. How long? Two to seven years are the most common investments. Some people do flip multifamilies, but a multifamily flip is two years. Why? Because people have rent contracts. And just because the contract came up for renewal doesn't mean you can jack it up all the way. If it's a good tenant and he's, he's $100 from market, you're probably gonna do it in two steps, 50 and then 50. So it takes two years to flip a multifamily. And it takes seven years to fully maximize it. If you wanna maximize the heck out of it, you wanna ev squeeze every last drop out of that orange, it is a seven year process. Now values don't decline sharply in a recession, right? What's the biggest reason for that? Well, what happens in a recession? In every recession in the US, millions of people have lost their homes. 2008 was ridiculous, but in every recession, you, you have multiple millions of people that lose their homes. Where do you think these people go to live? Some of them shack up with mom and dad. Some of them live in their cars, but the vast majority go to apartments. One of the key things that I like to show is, you know, a lot of people talk anecdotal, but you look at, Freddie Mac multifamily loans, and you look at serious delinquency rates. This was 2010, and this is single family, right? Right there, peaked at 4%. 4% is crazy. 4% of all the homes in the United States were in default right around 2010. Now take a look at what happened to multifamily during that same time. It's kind of hard to even tell what the hell happened, because all that really happened was there was a little, little bump here, and that was the default rate for multifamily. Right? So you look at it, now, now that things have improved, we're not at 
Single family is now at 0.95, which is great, by the way, for the single family market. Multifamily, 0.02% of all multifamilies in the US are in default at this point in time. That is how strong this asset class is. But that number is not impressive. This number is impressive. Look at that difference. Multifamily comes in classes. There's three completely different classes, class A, class B, class C. The problem is there is no real definition of this, right? Everybody has their slightly different definition of it. So I teach a lot of different classes where I tie classes back to dollars, I tie classes back to areas, but here's the base definition that you need to know. Most prestigious buildings, rich tenants who want to live in those buildings, they wanna be there. Buildings are generally newer. Typically class A is, is in the last 20 years. High quality standard finishes, so you typically get granite countertops, steel appliances, you get you know, indoor pools, all those sorts of things. There's no deferred maintenance. Something breaks, they fix it immediately, right? So there's no such concept of deferred maintenance in a class A. Exceptional accessibility, they're next to BART. They're next to a, a freeway exit. Very low cash flow, right? Long term upside for class A is very, very high, but you have to be an extraordinarily patient investor, which is why most investors investing in class A properties are funds. Funds have a 30 year outlook. So like CalSTRS, my, my wife is part of a $800 billion California teachers fund, and that fund is investing into multifamily, and they, when they buy, they hold for 20 years, right? And they don't sell in any particular year. They don't have a particular year to sell. Whenever they think it's, it's highly inflated, they sell. So they make a lot of money, but they're not looking at cash flow in any particular month. Now keep in mind, cash flow is more sensitive to recessions for class A. A lot of people will go from A to B, Bs will go to Cs. Now Bs are typical for the area, right? So you got average rents, they're a bit older than A, so, tip, so here's what happens. A lot of, in the US we don't build a lot of class Bs. When As are older than 20, they tend to become Bs, right? So they kind of roll over as they get older. There's always some deferred maintenance, Amenities are decent, right? So we still see tennis courts, or these days pickleball courts. Um, we see uh, pools, so there's quite a, a quite quite a good amount of amenities. You got better class of cash flow than class A buildings. You've got cap right, cap rates that are five to six and a half in uh, everywhere else in the U.S. In, in the Bay Area is a, a, the weirdest market in the U.S. I hope you guys know this. So Bay Area is the only market in the U.S. where class A is two and a half, three cap. Class B is three cap. Class C is three cap. So it really doesn't matter what the heck you're buying, you're buying the exact same cap. So you might as well buy, buy class A. The only thing that makes sense to buy in the Bay Area is three cap, because everybody, everything's selling at three cap. But what happens is that as, as we get from A to B to C, across the US, the cap rates increase, which means that prices per, per door drop. Cap rates going up means prices going down. C properties, which I tend to buy more, uh, two thirds of my portfolio is C's and one third is B's, they're typically older than 35 years old. No one in the US has ever built a C. The only way to build a C is to either build an A or build a B and then wait for a while. They eventually turn into C's, right? So they're always in need of uh, renovation and updating, which is really the value. Lower rents, higher level of mismanagement, so the best kind of guy to buy a classy building from is a doctor. Doctors are awesome in that they have lots and lots of money. They're also awesome in that they suck at managing it. So, and they love to buy buildings 2,000 miles away that they will never visit. So they're my favorite kind of, you know, basically seller, because they mismanage the heck out of their buildings because they're so busy with their practices, right? They gotta make the W-2 cash. So what you're looking for are owners that are not structured companies like ours. They don't have full-time asset managers on staff. They think that buying a 200 uh, you know, unit multifamily is basically the same as buying a duplex. So cap rates in the US these days are kind of closer to six, so not quite seven. Highest cash flow, so obviously when you're buying a class C, you're buying it for cash flow, so your ongoing cash flow levels are significantly higher. Keep in mind though, you won't get that cash flow when a recession happens, but only during the recession. In 2009, Class C cash flow was hit very hard for a year and hit somewhat hard for six more months. So we had 18 rough months. And that was the worst real estate recession in the last 100 years. So keep that in mind. Then there is D, which stands for don't buy. These are the war zones, right? These are the places that are extremely rough. And I, I teach a separate class 
Um, and you can look at that class on, online if you like at udemy.com slash realfocus. That tells you how to identify A's, B's, C's, and D's without ever vi visiting that, that particular city. Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y dot com slash real focus. One word. So all that great stuff about multifamily, there must be some downsides, right? There are three, they're all big. Number one, multifamily investments are illiquid. Unless you are so rich that you are the only investor in this big building, it's an illiquid investment. Now, technically speaking, I can modify that. I'm being harsh there. It's illiquid if it's not doing well. If it's doing well, and there's 50 investors, there's 49 buyers for your share. Everybody wants to buy your share. The problem is they still don't want to give you value. So you've invested $100,000 in it. Three years have gone by. Everyone's making money. Shouldn't your share be worth 150? You'll have trouble selling it for 150. They want to all buy it for 100, though. Right? So the problem is it's still illiquid in that you don't get market value the way that you do with stocks. And if it's not doing well, it's completely illiquid. Nobody will buy your share. You have lack of control, right? So I'm a type A personality. I have trouble giving up control. A lot of people here in the Bay Area tend to be like that. There's a complete lack of control. You have to trust a bunch of other people, right? But here's the mind shift. You're a type A personality, right? Are you or have you ever purchased stock? Have you purchased Google stock? Have you purchased Apple stock? Anytime you buy stock, what control do you have over Apple or Google? None. So all of us type A personalities are constantly investing in vehicles that we have no control over. The short idea, the short concept is when you invest in multifamily, the only difference between investing in Apple and investing in multifamily is Apple's billions and this is millions. You still have no control either way. And someone professional is managing it in each case. And those professional people, they spend their entire day managing those properties. So keep that in mind. Much harder to use 1031 benefits than single family. Uh, very, very few syndications, including my very last one. So we, we, we've just once done a project that allows 1031 in, 1031 out. But the vast majority of syndicators don't accept 1031 funds because it requires their legal structure to be much more complex. 1031 into a syndication requires something known as TIC, tenant in common. Whereas most indicators just want to stick an LLC in there and stick all the investors in there. Well, you can't do that. You gotta put all the tenant in comments in a tick. And every, let's say there's 10 of these uh, 1031 investors, you need 10 separate contracts. Whereas these 30 guys in the LLC only need one contract, right? So a lot of syndicators don't do it. We've now scaled to the point where we allow 1031. But, but still, 95% of syndications will not allow 1031 in, and they won't allow 1031 out. So those are the, th the, the three big benefits. Multifamily trends. A lot of you have been thinking about apartments, right? In the last two years, it's accelerated a lot. Four years ago, I would be teaching at a conference, and there'd be like fix and flip guys and all these other guys and notes guys, and then I would be the token multifamily guy. There used to be like six fix and flip guys. Today, I go to the conference, there's five multifamily guys and two fix and flip guys. So things have changed as the market cycle has advanced. More and more people are now looking for defensive investments. And obviously, multifamily is considered defensive. There is no way multifamily makes as much money as flips when everything is going up, right? In the San Francisco Bay Area four years ago, multifamily could not compete with fix and flips. Today is a completely different matter because today's market is not up, it's not down. It's up and down, right? It's a, it's a shaky market. In those markets, multifamily will beat the shit out of fix and flips. So here's some of the trends that are driving the insane growth. I think most people know this. Rent is the new buy. For the first time in our history, Americans prefer to rent. They prefer to rent. The Wall Street Journal and Appfolio said that, uh, and, and this is actually the National Associate of, uh, Association of Realtors, they said five to six million new renter households will be created in the next 10 years. Five to six million. We're not even producing half as many homes. So we've got, we're building a massive deficit every single month that goes by. What's even more interesting is when you ask people, do you anticipate becoming a homeowner in five years? 
the no answer is now bigger than the yes answer. If you asked this five years ago, or, or 10 years ago, or 20, or 30, or 40, or 50, the yes bar would be much longer, and the no bar would be much shorter. But today, more people are willing to say, no, I am not going to own a home. And it is not because of mortgages. The number one reason is not that I can't get a mortgage. It's don't want to own, and believe it or not, enjoy renting. They enjoy renting. Why? Because they get good schools, safe neighborhoods, parks and playgrounds, community centers, friendly neighborhoods. They can't afford those when they buy, but they can afford them, still afford them. Maybe not in the Bay Area, but this is a national survey. They can afford them when they rent. And then you have those millennials, those pesky millennials that give us all so much trouble. And so you look at the millennials, and they stopped buying homes or started buying less of them, not after 2008. Watch, watch my finger. In 2006, all adults in the US, that's millennials, this is non-millennials, decided to buy less homes. And then this is what is happening. Our home ownership rate actually picked up a little bit here for a year because 2018 and 2019 are the prime buying years for millennials. So it picked up a little bit and now has dropped again. If you look at academic journals in the US that track home ownership rates in the US, there is no academic journal, there is no study that shows this rate plateauing. Every single one of them says decline, horrible decline, catastrophic decline. Those are the three options that you can get in academic journals for home ownership rates in the US. And you're like, but, 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 but you know, people are selling homes like crazy in the Bay Area. We are building less homes today. So here's an example that will shock you. In California, today interest rates are below 4% for 30 years. We are building less than half the homes in California than we built in the 1980s when interest rates were 18%. We're building less than half the homes, under 4%, 18%. What people don't realize is new construction is not happening. Our ability to build affordable homes is completely gone. Back in the 80s, a good 30 or 40% of homes being built were starter homes. Now it's under 2%. Right, because no one can build a starter home, so they don't even try. As a result, we're building less and less homes, and those homes, because we're building less of them, they're still in, de in, in demand. So people are still paying for them. But what about the people that can, can, can't afford those homes? They're not even trying to build them, they're simply going the path of rentals. Yes? It depends. Uh, is, it, is it like a multifam, or is it one of those uh, condos that has a bunch of people living in them? I think they're, they're condos. Well, in my, if, if somebody owns them, I would still consider them to be a single-family purchase. Okay. But in terms of the total volume, they're not building enough of those either. So, so may, you know, I, I guess we need more palm trees then. So. <laughs> Um, because building starter homes is no number, non, longer economically viable. So the United States built New York in 150 years. It took us 150 years to build New York. Now imagine New York, and then imagine a country called China building a new New York every three months, right? They build four New Yorks a year, right? They're not interested in building our cities anymore. They're interested in building theirs. So everything that we buy from them is, is now more expensive at two to three times the cost of inflation. Inflation is low because technology is keeping it low. But when it comes to raw materials for construction, we're at three to four times the cost of inflation. So nowhere in the United States can we build starter homes and actually make profit. And the government stopped subsidizing home construction in 1999. What is this 
Um, well, I don't know, but um, when I look at the description below that, these are millennials. I think it's the age of 25 to 34, and then everybody else. Left oh, left-hand side, right-hand side. Okay, that's, that's what it really means. But these two lines are the age of 25 to 34, so millennials, and then this is everyone else, including the millennials. What's the most odd thing is these damn baby movers, right? We're, we're confused about the millennials, but the baby boomers, what they're supposed to do is, from their McMansions, they're supposed to, as they get older, they're supposed to downsize to smaller homes. They're not doing it. They're moving to urban apartments. We don't know it's because they, their millennial kids like to live in the city or because they want convenience access to services. No one's quite sure. But the baby boomers are not downsizing, they're apartment sizing. And they're doing, there's millions and millions and millions of doing it, and no one's quite figured out why. All we are sure is that it's happening. I believe, my personal belief, I, I, I don't have any data on this, is that the boomers saw 2008 and their psyche got damaged, right? So when they're moving, they're like, I, I'm just gonna move to an apartment because I don't want the stress of even a smaller home. So these trends represent an insane amount of opportunity, an incredible amount of opportunity. The next 10 years, or the next, I would say the next 13 or 14 years are going to be incredibly powerful for multifamily. I invite all of you to look at um, a website. There's a, there's a nonprofit website, and these guys are not, they're not trying to grind an ax. They're not representing the apartment community. It's called, it's, a, it's an easy to remember name, we, apartments.org. We are apartments.org. I encourage you to look there, and I encourage you to actually click on some of the metros. Some of my favorite metros to look at are Honolulu, Pittsburgh, and Phoenix. I won't tell you why I'm picking these three, but I assure you that if you look at Pittsburgh, Honolulu, and Phoenix, you're going to be shocked by the diversity of demand and supply in this country. One of those is, has a shocking deficit. One of those has way too many apartments. And then there's one in the middle. So the trends are very, very powerful and they represent opportunity. We're, we're late here, so I'm gonna skip the next section. Except to talk about this slide. So syndication is the mechanism by which people buy enterprise class buildings. We buy 20, $30 million buildings, we also build them. I'm right now building a $130 million building in Utah. And essentially what we do is we gather investors. Some of our smaller projects have as little as 20, some of our larger ones have as many as 100 investors. And they all invest partial amounts and they get partial ownership, which means that they get partial cash flow and they get partial tax benefits, right? So partial depreciation. So they're basically, they're getting a slice of everything, just like ownership, what they don't get a slice off is work. No tenants, no toilets. They're just sitting at home and reading these beautifully crafted emails that I send them every month with pictures of dogs biting tenants <laughs> and holes in, in doors from gunshots. And you know, of course I'm dramatizing, we've had one gunshot, but <laughs> we did take a picture of it and send it to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, pro, the investors so they feel like they're vicariously living this property through our eyes. So, and I think they're glad for that. All right, so the management team assigns an asset manager and a property management company to run the property. There's full-time staff, which is actually owned by the company. So the five or six people that work there, they're actually our employees, even though they work for the property manager. So they're billed to the property manager because if somebody breaks their legs, he has to sue the property manager. So we basically payroll them through the property manager, but if we fire the property manager, the employees are ours. It's a very convenient arrangement, right? So the property manager does charge us for their payroll, but we payroll them through the property manager because they carry $10 million in liability insurance and we don't. So I'm gonna end with these six reasons why people have been investing in multifamily for 1,100 years. Cash flow. If it does not cash flow, don't buy it, which is why I'm shocked when people buy multifamily in the Bay Area. Single family, there's a reason to buy. There's a significant amount of appreciation going on. But please note, rents in the Bay Area do not increase the way home prices increase here. 
They still increase at three, four, five percent a year on an annualized basis. Currently, rents in the Bay Area are falling. They're falling all across the Bay Area, in every, every part of the Bay Area, not even in San Francisco, where home prices are still increasing. So rents don't have the same dynamic as home prices. So make sure that you can cover the cost of operations, your management, utilities, maintenance, capital improvement, and financing your mortgage. And still, you must have money left, both for the promoters and for the investors. Those are the only kind of properties you want to buy. And then. Forced appreciation. Remember that slide where I told you you go up 25 bucks and then on 200 units and you make a million bucks? That's forced appreciation. That's an incredible benefit of multifamily. Professional management and metrics. I was a chief operations officer for 16 years. My life was all about KPIs, metrics, dashboards. That's what I lived by. I have never seen any investor in the US have KPIs and metrics on a weekly basis for their single family portfolio but I don't know of any multifamily property that doesn't have those metrics on a weekly basis. They do, they all do, right? Every property manager, he knows all these, uh, these acronyms that I'm gonna start spouting on Monday morning, he knows exactly what they mean. So it's an awesome area driven by metrics. Inflation protection, right? Everyone knows that we are printing money. All across the US, all across the world, we're printing money. And pretty much everybody knows that it ends at some point in hyperinflation. That is the only way out for countries to pay their debt back. So we will at some point hyperinflate. You will want to be owning real assets when we go into hyperinflation. When that happens, I have no clue. Tax benefits. So single family has a tax benefit called depreciation. And you guys think we're awesome. Have you heard of accelerated depreciation or cost segregation? In 2018 in September, I bought a property and investors put three million bucks into this property. It was a $12 million property. So they put three million bucks in. In February, I send every investor who invested 100 grand with me, I send them a negative 106, 106,000 K1. 100 grand investment, $106,000 negative. Accelerated depreciation. I've never heard of a single family anywhere in the US doing an accelerated depreciation schedule. Mayor? Mm -hmm. Yes, but usually not at ordinary income because the tax, the basis of the property has changed. Be and because there's a difference in basis, you're somewhere between ordinary income, which you would have paid today, and capital gains. So where you are, that is hard to tell depending upon how much the basis changes. But because the basis is changing, some of it, plus some of it you don't pay. For example, when I do accelerated depreciation, Instead of saying, I will depreciate this property, which is what you're doing for single family, I say things like, this chair only has five years of life. That printer only has two years left. So if I keep the property for five years, and this chair only had five years left, then at the end of five years, its value is zero. Yeah. Therefore, why would I pay that money back? It, its value is zero. It depreciated. So that's where the, cost the chair is still there after five years, yeah. but I no longer have to pay that money back. So that's where the cost segregation Cost is. segregation allows me to depreciate some things that I don't have to recapture because their value reaches zero. Just if, in case you're not getting this, multifamily is the greatest legal tax scam in America. <laughs> the greatest legal tax scam in America. 95% of the Fortune 500, not counting the dot-com guys, own massive amounts of real estate, and they, the biggest reason they do it for is tax protection. Some of the richest people in America do not pay any taxes at all. That same example that I gave you, the guy that invested three million bucks and, and basically you know, paid no taxes, that's all the rich people. That's how they pay no taxes, and they don't have to because the law allows them not to pay taxes. Right? And, and th there's so many other mechanisms that, that you can't apply to people that don't have 10 million bucks. There's a, they've actually got a way to not even recapture it at the end, just so you know. So the last one is economies of scale, right? I have one single maintenance office. I bring in stuff directly from China. Many of my properties I buy from a website called Alibaba. I don't know if you've heard of it, it's the most awesome website in the world. You can buy stuff in containers, and those containers come directly to your property, right? And they're locked, they have a code, the code's on the website, you unlock it, out come 30 or 40 you know, sets of appliances. Out come beds, because I have student housing properties. 
you can do all kinds of magical stuff at scale that you couldn't possibly do otherwise. My full-time employee who does stuff like laminate, you see below you, this is laminate, right? I'm paying them $18 an hour to do laminate. And my laminate is 69 cents per square foot from Alibaba. So my total cost of rehab for a 900 square foot unit is between $4,500 and $6,000. That's it, that's my total rehab. So what we do is known as lipstick on a pig. We are, it's totally cosmetic changes and we do it very, very fast. Five days, the unit is ready again and it's put back into circulation. $150 rent bump. Remember, 25 bucks a million, 150, six million. That's essentially what we're doing. It just takes us five years. Because not, not every tenant moves out, so we gotta wait for them to move out before we can do it. So those are all the different reasons. The life cycle, life cycle I think, is an advanced concept, so I don't wanna go into it. I do wanna point out some of my projects. I'm gonna skip past this very quickly. We do both new construction as well as value add projects. This is our current project. It's our most ambitious project. An entire city block in Provo where we were buying four pieces of land. This, this, piece, this block is actually four separate pieces of land. The city of Provo, uh, Provo is an incredible city. It's, it's uh, currently the only city ever to have won best performing city in the US twice. And both years, San Jose, California was the runner up. So Provo was the winner in 2017 uh, and 18. The 19 awards have not been announced and I'm pretty sure Provo's gonna win again. So the downtown Provo is about half a mile this way and the city wanted to extend downtown here so they built this massive station. You see all these cars parked? This is the station. If you look very carefully, there's a train right here. There's a train and there's a station right there and there's a bus station here with free buses. You can go anywhere in Provo, anywhere in Orem for free on the bus. And the best kind of project ever is one that the city wants built. I love going in and building where the city actually wants a, a project built. Because we were having trouble with this project because we told the city, you know, we've got, we've got challenges, you know, we've only got three pieces of land, it doesn't make sense to build. And the city's like, well, actually, we happen to own the fourth piece of land, right? <laughs> And, and, uh, and we're like, okay, so will you sell it to us? And they're like, no, we'll do it something better. We'll decide what the price of the land is, and we'll give it to you for free. And when you sell this property 11, 13 years from now, you can give us today's price then. Apparently this is legal, right? Should be completely illegal because we're a for-profit business, but because they want it done, they did it. This is exactly our arrangement with them. Then we came back to them and said, guys, you want parking, and you know, for all these units that we're building, there's a lot of parking. Parking's really expensive. It's costing a 19 million bucks, so I think we may not be able to do it. So they're like, well, technically there's a train station over there. The problem is you've got railway tracks, and the way that we, we do what is known as transportation-oriented development, it has to be a road. There's no road here, right? So you have to kind of go down a mile this way, and then go over the tracks, and then come down. So you're really two miles away from transportation. And we're like, oh, that's really sad because then you know, we would have been able to reduce the amount of parking if we were transportation-oriented development. So they're like, aha, we have an idea. So they come back to us six weeks later with this. And they said, we have a federal grant. We're gonna build this $5 million bridge for you from your property onto the other side of the tracks, the train station. Now, you're only about 400, 500 feet away from transportation, so you're TOD. And they did this, they gifted this bridge to us, and as a result, they cut our parking down by $19 million. Wow. This is what happens in America. I'm not saying I'm some special guy. This happens every time a city wants construction done. If they don't want it done, they will drag you through the mud for five years. <laughs> so just so you know, the other side of it is nasty. What happens in California? So every project in California is like that. So I'm gonna rename California to Taxifornia because that's really what it's becoming. Just, you know, all they do is find other, newer ways of taxing us. So Provo, you see all these panels? We're not paying a buck. Our developer is basically reached a power purchase agreement or a PPA with the city. We're renting our roof and getting income for solar. Where in California, you're forced to put solar on the roof and pay for it. We're making money from solar 
every single year. Why? Because this is Utah, where they do something that California has never dreamed of doing. They balance their budget. So we, I am a liberal Democrat. You cut me and I bleed blue, but I only invest in red states. And I'm, I'm honest and proud of saying that because these states are business friendly. They want to get stuff done. They're not putting all sorts of roadblocks in your way. My project in St. George, Utah, before this one, we went to the mayor's office to introduce ourselves, and we're talking with him, and we're saying, you know, we think that it's going to take us about a month, month and a half to get, um, you know, plans approved. So he's like, we're sitting in his office, and he's like, where are the plans? We're like, well, here's the plans. We wanted to show them to you. He's like, oh, no, no, come with me. He gets us into his massive, big suburban SUV. We drive two miles to the city office, walks in there, says, bring the rubber stamps, and he stamps all of that stuff in. <laughs> that was the end of our planning process, a visit to the mayor's office, right? You try and do that in California in nine months, you are God. You know, it's going to take you a year to, to get something like that done for a 200-unit uh, property. This is why we're building in places that make sense. One, another reason why we love Provo, Provo more, has Mormons. Mormons make lots of babies. <laughs> you want to invest in places that have extremely high population growth because it's directly tied to rent growth, right? So I love Provo. Also, the only state in the, in the union that actually has a functioning social net is Utah. If you give 10% of your income to the church, and a lot of people do it, then when you leave, lose your job, the church pays for your health care and your rent, often for as much as six months. As a, as, a, uh, as a result, the average delinquency in Utah is 0.2%. 10 times, it, California is 10 times higher than that, even today. So these are the sort of places that we're buying in. And we're able to build them very quickly. So this is an 18-month construction. This is all four phases, but we're only doing one phase at this point in time. This, this one's not eligible for 1031, but it is eligible for solo foreign canes and SDIRA, any kind of QRP. It is opportunity zone eligible. What that means is it's essentially tax-free. If you don't know what opportunity zones is and you have capital gains, you really need to spend 20 minutes understanding what opportunity zones are. It's 10 years of tax-free investment. So look into opportunity zones. And that, that's our presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your time. So the same thing's happening in Utah. Construction costs are still up in Utah. So home prices uh, in Utah have doubled, basically, in the last seven or eight years. We are catering to people who can't afford to buy a $260,000 um, home in Utah. They're not paying a million bucks like us, but there's still a huge number of people that can't afford $260,000 homes, and they are our audience. What we're able to do, though, is we're able to build very nice granite countertop steel appliance properties that are $1,400 in rent. 1,000 square feet, massive clubhouse, gym, all kinds of amenities, 1,400 bucks. Why wouldn't they want to live there? So borrowing for multifamily happens at the, at the LLC level. No one is signing on a loan. No investor of mine has ever signed on a loan for multifamily. The loan is on the property itself. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac lend to us. Right now, our uh, lending rates for a 10-year fixed loan is, uh, are about 3.75%. We don't get a 30-year loan in multifamily. We get 10-year loans, 30-year amortization, if you know what that means. But the loan itself ends after 10 years, and we have to get a fresh loan. Yes? So uh, depends. So the short answer is you have to come and talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, and then it's also for non-accredited investors. Uh, this project is for accredited investors, but we do, we do eight projects a year, six that are only for accredited, and then two that are for accredited and non-accredited. If you don't know what that term means, come to me and I'll explain it to you. It's, it's straightforward. A lot of people in the Bay Area are accredited because of our income levels. On something like this, what's the construction cost? So uh, the total, the phase one, which is, let me go back. Oops. Phase one is uh, 210 units for about 36 million, so 150,000 a unit. Are you like in prime on something like that? What's that? Construction loans, like uh, construction loans are about 6%, so roughly 6%. 
Uh, more or less, yeah, right? I'm, I'm not sure what single family construction loans cost like. I haven't done single family new construction for a while. So our first phase is, whoop, there we go. So that building, and we call this, we call it the wrap building. So this is 210 units, the first, first we, so build this, populate it, then build this condo tower, then build this office tower, and then last, build this multifamily. So we like doing things in phases because it's easier to cash flow that way. So the bridge that you were showing, the transit, uh -huh. um, what's the timing for that? In the bridge will be built, uh, they have to build it and finish it by the end of 2020 because it's a federal grant that expires in December 2020. Phase one it starts in a month and completes in 18 months. Uh, the whole project is five, five years long. So in a typical project, what is the promoter's equity and carried interest if you are talking about? 30, 70. So the investors make 70%, the promoters make 30. That is the most common split between promoters and, and uh, syndicators in the U uh, and, and investors in the US. But investors have something known as preferential treatment or PREF. Because of the PREF, if the property underperforms, the split can change to 100 zero okay. on underperforming properties. And a subsequent question to that is like, let us say during the middle of the project, if you want to raise additional capital, how, how do you do that? Two options. Okay. If you are like me, I have 1,800 investors, I just go find more investors. Okay. If you didn't have that, you would do a cash call, which is very painful because you're raising money from existing investors. I just don't do that. Mm -hmm. So I have a bigger question. So why would one want to invest in a syndicator deal versus a fund or versus just a partnership? So a fund and a partnership are different. So when, you, when you're talking about a fund, is that like a syndicator's fund or like some public billion dollar fund? So the short answer is, have you looked at returns for REITs? REITs are returning half of what we're returning. So honestly, I, I'm not into bashing REITs because I invest in REITs myself. Okay, there's a, a place for a REIT, but REITs will not do this. What REITs do is they buy completely stabilized buildings from people like me. I go in, into a building, I evict a bunch of people that are non-paying, I rehab those units, I stabilize the building, I raise rents. Two years later, it's got a beautiful clubhouse, a gorgeous community, four-star reviews on Google. That REIT is then buying this property from me, and then he's running it for the next five years. So all of the trouble in the property and all of the profit was squeezed out by us. And then we gave it to the REIT. And the REIT is now going to make, give you 6 or 7%, which is only cash flow. There's really not much appreciation at this point because he's not doing anything to the property, right? He's just running it as it is. And as a, re as a result, you can't get returns as high. Because as far as I know, all, all REITs are Goldman Sachs guys. They sit in 50-foot tall glass buildings, and most of them don't even visit their property. We are on a phone call with a property manager twice a week for five years. Big difference. No REIT has ever heard of Alibaba.com. <laughs> yeah? Is there a minimum hold time for this investment? There isn't, but there's a typical hold time. Five years. Five years is the most typical hold time, but I've seen projects sell in three, and I've seen projects hold for seven. Then there's some projects that are 10 years. So opportunity zone projects are always 10 years because the, uh, the government requires 10-year holds for tax benefits, right? Uh, but in general, the most common hold for apartments is five years. That, that, it takes that long to maximize. Remember, if people are living in there and they keep paying you more in rent, you gotta wait for them to leave. You can't just kick them out. Uh, no. Um, going back to my concept of blue-blooded liberal that only invests in red states. You go there and you say rent control, they're like, what's that? <laughs> rent control? Yeah, no, no, I'm not interested in rent control states. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> Um, you can use self-directed IRA money. So basically, if you have a 401k with your employer, the moment you leave an employer, the employer allows you to boot that money into something known as a self-directed IRA. 
There are $13 trillion currently in IRA funds. Self-directed simply implies that you can decide what to do with it. You simply cannot invest it into one of your own projects, but you can go around investing it in other people's projects. 25% of all money that we receive comes from self-directed IRA or solo 401k. So when you say it's eligible, I mean, I, I guess all the projects are eligible then, right? No. A lot of syndicators don't take self-directed funds because we have to report to every provider every year. So if I have 100 investors and 25 of them are using self-directed and they're using 14 different companies, at the end of the year, I have to report to 14 different companies. So a bunch of syndicators don't do it. On, on SDIRA, yes, and could be as high as 39.6%. In practic Practically speaking, more like 15 or 16%. That's the most common number. Um, but there's a way around that. Three years ago, uh, the government allowed you to, to open a, a 401k called Solo 401k. Solo 401ks have the same annual uh, costs as SDIRA. As far as I know, UBIT or UBTI does not apply to Solo 401ks. So most people are rolling uh, self-directed IRAs into solo 401k. So it takes a week to do. These days, almost every company that has a uh, self-directed IRA also has a solo 401k, so you can call your company and roll it over, and then it only takes three days. Um, you have to have a business, or you have to come see me at the end, so I'll... I'll... <laughs> Anybody can have a business. It doesn't actually need to make money. <laughs> Right? Don't you have your sole group of partners that you can repeat projects with? So why would you want to bring in people? Right? Um, your source of capital locked down. So, Alicia, yes. I'm uh, th that that is going to be true of me someday. But right now, I work with investors that once they give me a hundred thousand dollars, it takes them a while to give me another hundred. <laughs> so that's that's really the honest answer. Uh, but syndicators like me, within ten years of starting get to the point where they only work with people that just keep giving them money, and so you'll never hear from us again. <laughs> and I'll take one last question. One last question, yes sir. Um, so this one is what is known as 17 IRR. Essentially, this project is about 176% return over 10 years. So it's, it's a higher IRR because there's a refi involved very early on in the process, which raises your IRR, so about 16, 17. Uh, if you are using opportunity zone funds, about 23, 24, because you're not paying any taxes. All right, well, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm around, let's take a picture, thank you.